Hello, everyone. We're back. Corey Hughes, Bloody History. Uh, we're going to uh, finish up today the uh, Kerry Thornley, uh, Clay Shaw grand jury stuff. Um, so, I hope you had a good weekend and a good New Year's. And I hope you bought my book. Uh, if you haven't yet, you can go on Amazon and pick it up. It's called A Warning from History. Uh, it is a really good foundation to be able to follow along with what I'm talking about. Uh, once you get through that book, all of these shows that I've done will make a little bit more sense. They'll be a little more cohesive. You'll see the relationships between everything. And uh, But we're going to pick up right where we left off. I don't really feel like prefacing the last show, so go back and watch it. It's available on podcast, and the videos are available on Rockfin Premium. And I apologize for having them on Rockfin premium but rockfin um has kind of backed us into a fucking corner uh in as far as how we can present our videos and still get paid uh they changed their policy if it's not premium we don't get paid period so unfortunately it's how it has to be um but uh that is that so let's continue um this is from the uh 8th of february 1968 Orleans Parish Grand Jury for the trial of Clay Shaw. The trial will happen for another year, not until January of 69. So, all right, let us continue. What month did you quit working at the Sherlington House? As I say, sometime in the late summer, I think it was August or September, when I left to go to Freedom School. Uh, when I came back, I stayed there for about two weeks. This was just about a month after I left. How long would you say it was after you testified before the Warren Commission? I testified in the spring, and uh, this was in the fall. Now the exact day and month, I don't know. Let's go back to what you can recall when Oswald was speaking Russian with somebody in the in the Fanks. I don't think that's the right word. In the spring of 1959 at El Toro. Probably ranks. It's probably supposed to be ranks. Speaking Russian with somebody in the ranks in the spring of 1959 at El Toro. What do you remember about that? The vivid thing I remember is the laughter. I remember the two guys talking in a foreign language. Oswald spoke Russian. I heard he spoke Russian. And all I could remember at the time of the assassination about this was that a guy with a name like Heidel, some name like that, had an H. And this guy was speaking Russian with Oswald. Or what I assumed to be Russian. And they laughed. This happened a number of times. But there was the laughter that, but it was the laughter that impressed me, and I thought, well, they knew Russian, and they can tell jokes in it, some knowledge of the language when they can tell jokes in it, and it seemed they were speaking it just to show off, both of them. Who was that he was talking to? Well, I don't know who it was, but Jenner told me it was Heindel. I thought that must have, must be because the name sounded like Heidel. I thought it was the same name at first. What is your recollection independently as to who it was? Well, I don't have any independent answer, because that's like saying, what's the answer if you don't know the answer? I just don't know. No, I am getting to your statement in the affidavit here, in your sentence, quote, I knew ever since the time of my conversation with Mr. Jenner that the name of the second party in the Russian-speaking incident was John Heindel, end quote. Right, because he told me it rang a bell. I knew it was a name that sounded like Heindel. It was a logical thing as I reconstructed it because he said it was Heidel. And I said, oh. And he said, no, it really was Heindel. He told me he had been remembering Heindel and I had no reason not to believe that it was true for I knew it was a name that sounded like that. Your affidavit states that when Jenner said his name was really Heindel, you stated that, quote, I realized that this was the name that I had been searching in my memory for in connection with the man who spoke Russian with Oswald in the barracks at Muster. I realized... It because Heidel reminded me of that name and Jenner was confirming it. I realized it. Is this correct, your statement? Quote, it was Mr. Jenner's mentioning of that name at lunch that day that caused me to immediately recollect that this was the name that I had been groping for and could not remember. Yes, that was my statement, but that statement is not correct. Oh, it isn't. No, I did not mean for it to be incorrect, but it worked out logically. Okay, all right, all right, all right. I got I gotta, just got to stop. This fucking guy. This fucking guy. This guy 
I would say he's a master of anti-interrogation. He definitely had anti-interrogation training. That's what this is. Yes, that was my statement. But that statement is not correct. Oh, it isn't? No, I did not mean for it to be incorrect, but it worked out logically. What do you gather from that? Besides being confused, which is the point. What about this statement? Quote, I do not remember the exact words, but I am sure I made it clear to Mr. Jenner that John Heindel was the man I had referenced to in my previous testimony and whose name I could not recall while under oath. I think I said to Mr. Jenner, oh, Heindel, that is the name. Of course, because it sounded like Heidel and Heidel reminded me of this incident. That kind of recollection, I wasn't trying to lie. It was just recollection. And when I read it, it didn't seem like it was wrong. What is your rec recollection now as to the man who was speaking Russian with Oswald? I still think it was Heindel. Otherwise, why would the name Heidel have brought the Russian-speaking incident to mind? I understand the reasoning. Well, that is my recollection. Maybe there was another man in the outfit with a name like Heidel, too. And maybe it could be that. But aside from that, I... A John Rene Heindel? Also, Heindel with a Y. Was that the man? The John could be... But the middle name Rene didn't mean anything to me because we didn't go by, you know. Have you ever seen John Rene Heindel? Or Heindel with a Y? I saw him in the outfit, apparently. I recall him as a tall blonde guy. I don't know. I didn't feel that I could identify him. And he said, well, we will leave that out. Could you now recall ever seeing John Rene Heindel? I do not recall how he looked except a vague impression of a tall blonde guy. Can you recall John Rene Heindel being in your unit? I recall him being a Marine in my Marine unit on the basis of somebody with a name like that. I heard that name when I was in the unit and I associated that name with the Russian incident. <clears throat> was that at El Toro or at Sugi? El Toro. Do you recall him at Sugi? No, not at all. I think he was mustered out. When you came back in 1963 from Mexico in September... You went back to work at the Sheraton Charles, is that right? Yes. You worked there until September 20th, 1963, according to their records. Is that correct? That would seem entirely correct. Then where was your next job? My next job was at Arnaud's. In the meantime, I was working as well as I recollect at Castillo's off and on. Your job at Arnaud's began on November 14th, 1963. Does that sound correct? Yes. Okay, so what do we have here? We have more clarification on Kerry Thornley's movements and activities, right? So uh, according to Kerry Thornley, he had left to go to California from New Orleans in May of 1963, passing through Mexico City. He then returned uh, to New Orleans... I believe the date September 4th is in my memory. I'm not sure if that's correct, but it's around that time that he would have made his trip back from California. But he admitted earlier in this testimony that he had passed through Mexico City again. So making that his second time, right? And so then that's what they're referring to here. So he gets back to New Orleans through Mexico City, well, allegedly from California through Mexico City. I have no doubt he was in Mexico City those two times. Was he in actually California those times? I don't think so. I bet you he was in Dallas. I'd be willing to bet. But here, he's coming back from California, allegedly, through Mexico City, and arriving back, I believe it was around September 4th, right? Okay, so then he works until September 20th at the Sheraton Charles, okay? So he's only there for about, what, two weeks? Just over two weeks, right? One paycheck. It is during this time period that we can say with certainty that Kerry Thornley had a big bushy beard like a bearded beatnik. We have no commentary on if, if, on if the Sheraton Charles allowed him to work with a, a beard like that. My suspicion is no. My suspicion is no, and that he wasn't working at all. 
and that he was doing things in New Orleans around the assassination, like on September 17th, going to the embassy and getting um, the Lee Harvey household uh, visa to go to Mexico City. And as I commented in my um, private chat the other day, if you're not a member of the private chat, you can you can join the chat. Uh, you can go to uh, buymecoffee.com slash gfkbook and there's links there. But um, where was I going with this? So yeah, ultimately I don't think he was working at the Sheraton Charles because he had a big bushy beard this whole time because he's seen by Perry Russo in this exact time frame between September 4th and September 20th. Then, this is really perfect timing. We don't have any record of him having a job until Arnaud's November 14th. Which he definitely was working at Arnaud's November 14th. Either that or he had people covering for him there at Arnaud's. Um, because allegedly, according to Kerry Thornley, 36 hours after the assassination, right? So the Saturday and going into Sunday around 11 o'clock, allegedly um, the... Secret Service came and saw him. And then on the sun, the next day, 24 hours later, the FBI came and saw him. Uh, and he was working at our nose at the time. Allegedly. <laughs> Unless the Secret Service or FBI can verify that. Who the fuck knows? Um, but, yeah, this time frame of September 4th to September 20th, when he allegedly worked at the Sheraton Charles, this perfectly lines up with uh, the Perry Russo sightings. And the gap between September 20th and November 14th also perfectly aligns, at least initially, God, I would say entirely, almost entirely. Holy shit. Almost entirely with Kerry Thornley's uh, impersonations of Oswald in Dallas. Okay, this is fucking great. I'm going to have to write this out in a timeline. Um, so, Kerry Thornley allegedly leaves for California in May of 1963, passing through Mexico City on his way to Whittier, California. I think he's in Dallas this time. He's not in fucking California. He might have gone to California, seen his parents, and then dipped to Dallas, but I think that's what happened, okay? I don't have to dig into his alibi. His job alibi is out in California. He had two restaurant jobs out there. So... But that's that's irrelevant to the point I'm making here. The point I'm making here is that he comes back through then on around September 4th, arriving back in New Orleans. Allegedly has his job at the Sheraton Charles, but he has a big bushy beard at this time, um, as per Perry Russo. And then Perry Russo sees them at the party. And then this perfectly aligns with the timing that uh, Kerry Thornley goes to Mexico City and then returns... In uh, early October, heads to Alice, Texas with Marina, heads back all the way through those small towns where they were seen like a dozen times together with a pregnant Marina and June in the car. Perfect timeline. Perfect timeline. And then he is in... Dallas in October, November, when all the Oswald sightings are going on, right? <laughs> and then in November, what's what do we have going on in November? In November, after the birth of um, Oswald's second child, we have the incident at Furniture Mart in, in, in mid-November, early to mid-November. And then he allegedly, um, shit, he had to go back to New Orleans, he had to go back to New Orleans because he had to have a job as an alibi, right? <laughs> oh my God, he's so fucking transparent. It's so transparent. So yeah, that's fucking what happened. This is just more evidence against Kerry Thornley. Um, him acknowledging his timeline and his timeline completely corresponds with the Oswald sightings in Dallas and the trips to Mexico City and everything. <clears throat> then where was your next job? My next steady job was at Arnaud's. In the meantime, I was working as well as I could recollect at Castillo's on and off. Your job at Arnaud's began on November 14th, 1963. Does that sound correct? Yes. 
Between September 20th and November 14th, 1963, did you not have a steady job during that period? Right. I did have $75 that Vic kicked uh, back and I was working at Castillo's. How regularly did you work at Castillo's? Sometimes three or four days in a row. It was just for tips and I also got meals there. So just for tips means there's no paper trail, right? Didn't happen. Uh, during that seven-week period, your only employment was at Castillo's? Yes, off and on. It was a hard period. We were struggling. There were days when I felt like laying in bed and staring at the walls. I just couldn't get a job, you know. You mentioned earlier that in 1961, you had a post office box here. How long did you keep that post office box? Uh-oh. We're getting into post office boxes. Oh, God, the post office box drama was so easy to fucking debunk and sort. <sighs> Another failure for the JFK, quote, research community. Um, you mentioned earlier in 1961 you had a post office box. How long did you keep that post office box? I kept it about a year, I think. I'm not sure. I think that after the post office moved, they moved from Lafayette Square. I don't remember going to the other building. Is there any particular reason why you took a post office box in Lafayette Square? <clears throat> I was across the street from Fred's Inn, where I was living, and it was right down the street from Camp Street. Where did you live on Camp Street? I think it was the 900 block. The landlord was Francis Landry. It was right near Lee's Circle. Did you ever have an occasion to go to the Newman building where Guy Bannister had an office? <laughs> no. I don't know the name. Uh, hold on a second. No, I don't know. The name Guy Bannister rang a bell. I was in Tampa and on, on TV, and they went through this list with all the names that were in the Playboy interview, which I hadn't read yet. And the name Guy Bannister rang a bell. And yesterday, when I was in the office, I was shown a picture, and I recognized it, and it turned out to be Guy Bannister. I, I did not look at it and say Guy Bannister, but I looked at it and I said, I know that guy, and I know that name. He was very familiar looking, you know, somebody like in the Bourbon House, somebody I talked to. His office was 531 Lafayette Street, across from the post office. Does that refresh your recollection? Now, just to clarify, 531 Lafayette Street and 544 Camp Street are the same building. Same building. Led to the same offices. I think I might have seen it. Uh, I might have walked by it, you know. Guy Bannister written there, and I might have walked by on my way to Walgreens when I first got to New Orleans. His office was behind the Mancuso restaurant behind Lafayette and Camp. Does this not ring a bell? Which side is Lafayette on? The side of the unemployment office? Canal. Did you ever use that unemployment office up there? Where was it? You just asked. Oh, you mean the state unemployment office? Yes, I used that. It was right after I got to New Orleans and I got tired of starving and I decided to go in there. What years did you use that? Right after I got to New Orleans in 1961. How about 1962? I might have gone in there looking for a job. About 1963? Might have. You cannot remember independently going in there in 1963? No, I can't remember unless I was just going around all the places where I might get a job. Can you remember not going there in 1963? No, as I say, I might have gone in looking for a job. Oh my fucking God, I hate this guy. The reason I say that Oswald went there very systematically. Have you ever been in Jones Printing Company on Gerard Street? No. The first thing I did when I got to New Orleans, I wanted to know everything about writing from the time you wrote the stuff on paper until the book was published. And I went to this... I called all these printers up and said I would like to get a job as an apprentice if I could, and I'm willing to do work hard, but I have a beard and nothing ever came of it. Did that include the Jones Printing Company? It might have. I don't remember. Uh, there was one guy I talked to, and he was almost interested in hiring me, but I don't know the name of the company. Maybe if you were to mention it, it would ring a bell. Have you ever been to the Mexican Council in the Whitney Building? No, there was some kind of Mexican council down on the sidewalk with a display window to go to Mexico, that kind of thing. I waited for a bus there a couple of times. Where was that? It might have been the Whitney Bank building. Okay, so now Kerry Thornley's putting himself at the Mexican consul at the bus stop out front. All right, so this guy is, from the beginning, he wanted to tell his story. 
a juror asks, uh, that was the St. Charles Hotel. Have you ever been in the International Trade Mart? No, I was in that building on the corner of Camp and Common, the International something, the International House. The International Trade Mart was on Camp and Common. I have been in there, yes. I was in there with Clint once on the second floor. Clint was going to talk to a friend of his, and I asked him who he was going to see, and he said, Jeff Core. That's really Jesse Core. I said, I hope that wasn't Clay Shaw. No, it's funny, because the man, man he's naming as Jeff Core is actually Jesse Core, and Jesse Core was Clay Shaw's PR man. Okay, so here we go. Kerry Thorne, they can't keep his fucking mouth shut. He's admitting that he knows Clay Shaw here. Duh. And then the next question is, Jess Cor is a close friend of Clay Shaw. Was it Clint going to see Cor? What was Clint going to see Cor about? I don't know. He was going to see him, and I happened to be with him. And I looked at these windows and saw these displays from Guatemala. Some artwork or something. And then we went back out. I think there was somebody else with him, but I don't remember. I didn't recollect... That it was Jess Cor. Clint had told me that. Do you remember when that was? No. One time when I was in New Orleans, I was inside that building because that was one of the things that had been in the news. And it was, uh, and was I ever in that building? You know, Clint said uh, it was, it wasn't the International Trade Mart. He said it was a different place. He called it the International House. And I said, who are we in there to see? And he said, an old friend of mine, Jess Cor. It looks like it had said Jeff Core, and now it's been corrected to Jess Core in the transcript. And he has always told me that he was a good friend of Clay Shaw's. Who said that? Clint told me that. Clint Bolton? Yes. Hang on, let me reread that. Do you remember when that was? No. One time when I was in New Orleans, I was inside that building because that was one of the things that had been in the news. And was I ever in that building? You know, Clint said it wasn't the International Trade Mart. He said it was a different place. He said it was called the International House. And I said, who are we in there to see? And he said, an old friend of mine, Jess Core. And he has always told me that he was a good friend of Clay Shaw's. Okay, so he's referring to Jess Core as the good friend of Clay Shaw's, not Clint Bolton himself. Who said that? Clint Bolton told me that. Clint Bolton? Yes. You left the Sheraton Charles the second time on September 20th, 1963. Now going back, can you remember about a week afterward where you were? I've been going through this whole September thing so much in my mind. Have you reached some result as to this last week in September? No. The only thing referring to this time period, ever since the assassination, Barbara Reed said, mark my words, when the truth of the assassination comes out. And this was within a week after Oswald was killed. And it was in her house one night. And she said, when the truth of the assassination comes out, it will be a New Orleans-based conspiracy. It will have right-wing elements involved, and it will have something to do with Latin elements. Okay, so they're asking him about the last week of September, because that was when the trip to Mexico City was, right? September 26th. And he had to have left by September 25th. And of course it was goddamn Carrie Thornley. Okay. Garrison knew this. God, everything Garrison's asking him about, Eric Garrison's team is asking him about, uh, Garrison knew the answer to. If not at this time, years later, he will eventually figure it out. What do you recall thinking about this last week in September? Let me tell you, you know, how... First, how I got onto thinking about it to begin with. She said she had been uh, seen with me with Oswald in my little corner of the bourbon house where I sat whenever it was empty. And she had said to me a couple of times, you have a nice voice or something like that. I did not know her too well, but I had seen her around and I had been introduced to her casually. We weren't friends or anything. She was sitting up at the bar and I was sitting down here and somebody was on the right on my right, and she said, I am sure you were sitting there with Oswald. I am positive it was Oswald, because I never forget a face. I have been a casting director, and I never forget a face. He was very, very neat. And he was sitting there and talking to you, and I made that comment to you about your voice. And I remember the incident. I was sitting there one day. I was talking to somebody, and Barbara Reed did make a comment about my voice. And the reason I think it was not it was not is because first of all, that night she was talking to me and we decided after talking about two hours that she was so sure of herself and all of this travel pattern had emerged. And I'm saying Barbara is suggesting she's saying 
Well, maybe you didn't recognize him. He came walking in, and of course, there was always the other consideration that I was revising the book at that time. And he could have come walking in. She could have been convinced that this is what probably happened. He came walking in and sat next to me. And we were talking to her, and she made this comment on my voice, and she went back to her conversation, and I went back to mine. <laughs> did she see you with Oswald? I don't think she did, because the next day I started asking people, You don't think so? I don't know whether it was Oswald. I can't remember who was sitting there with me. I don't think it was Oswald for two reasons. The first thing is, if I could remember who it was, then I could say definitely in view of the fact that... Let me stop right fucking here. If you out there in listener land had a fucking sat down and had a conversation with Lee Harvey Oswald... And then a month later, Oswald kills the president. Don't you think you'd remember if you had a conversation with Oswald in the Bourbon House? If you had gone through the Marines with Oswald and knew him for three months, and you definitely knew who he was, and you guys were somewhat acquaintances, uh, and then all of a sudden he showed up and sat at your table and started talking to you, don't you think you'd remember that if it was the first time you'd seen him uh, since, what, late 1959? Yeah, I think that you'd fucking remember. But this is Kerry Thornley's statement. I'm going to read this again. This is goddamn unbelievable. Quote, I don't know whether it was Oswald. I can't remember who was sitting there with me. I don't think it was Oswald for two reasons. The first thing is if I could remember who it was, then I could say definitely in view of the fact that Jesus fucking Christ. This is probably the most hard-hitting paragraph I've ever goddamn read from Carrie Thornley directly. This is unbelievable. I don't remember if it was Oswald. All right, back to the next question. I understand those facts, but in view of the fact that you were writing a novel about him, I should think that you would recognize him. Yes, that was Barbara's theory. Was her theory right? I don't know. First of all, the next day I started saying to Barbara, to people, Barbara is sure she saw me with Oswald in the Bourbon House. That's the first thing. I kept asking people. Did you ask them... If they saw you at the Berman house with Oswald. No, I did not ask them. How would they know? What the fuck, Carrie Thornley? All right, so. I don't know. First of all, the next day I started saying to people, Barbara is sure she saw me with Oswald in the Berman house. That is the first thing. I kept asking people. Did you ask them if they saw you at the Berman house with Oswald? No, I did not ask them. How would they know? What the fuck? He just said he kept asking people. Barbara was there. I said, Barbara is sure she saw me at the Bourbon House with Oswald. I don't know whether it is true or not, but she is sure she saw me there and she has convinced me that she saw me. And everybody said, oh, Barbara Reed gets involved with everything that happens. Is it possible that you were with Oswald at the Bourbon House? I don't think it is possible, for here's the other reason. I remembered this thing that happened after she turned away, and after she went back to conversing with this person at the bar, and I felt obligated to explain to this person sitting with me, that is Barbara Reed, she is a character around here, to somebody who did not know Barbara, she is a witch or something like this, and I felt that there is a barrier to my explaining this to this person, and this could only have been the Cuban waiters at the Sheraton Charles. And the only barrier would have been a language barrier. Why did I feel that this was a barrier? And on the basis of that, that is all I know. On the basis of that, I am sure I was not with Oswald. But Barbara is sure I was. All right, have you finished giving me the basis for getting to what you were doing the last week of September? That is the only thing. I don't know what I was doing. With all the thought you've given it, you don't know what you were doing the last week of September 1963? Look, first of all, I was not working. This is the week after you quit Sheraton Charles. You quit on the 20th. It is rather distinct in your mind because you do not care for this man. Oh yes, the week after I quit the Sheraton Charles, I was in the Dumaine Street apartment. Lane and Millie Fletcher were with me. What number on Dumaine? Above the little general, I don't remember the number. And it was the $20 a month apartment I had, and I had decided that I was going to write 
and I would do odd jobs to keep myself alive, and I would write, and Lane and I have never gotten along because we have such different ideas about all sorts of things. And right after I quit working at the Sheraton Charles, I went walking with them, and we went over to the Kaplinger house, and Lane made some linen covers for pillows. This happened that week, I am certain, after I quit the Sheraton Charles. What were you doing that week? Were you working any place? No, I don't think I was working, unless I was working spottily one or two days at Castillo's. I think I just drifted for a while until I got the thing at Castillo's. I was working for tips. I was a fed there. <laughs> How many days a week was that? It varied. Sometimes it was uh, for three or four days in a row. It depended on his other waiters and when they showed up. Can you remember if you went to work for Castillo that first week between the 20th and 27th? I doubt it because, as I say, I think I just drifted for a while. During that time, did you have occasion to drift out of New Orleans at all? I don't think so. The only time I recall going out of New Orleans at all was working for or trying to work for encyclopedias and being taken across the lake and then over to Algiers, you know. Where across the lake? Over the bridge and taken to some suburb and knock on doors and then they picking us up and taking us back. I don't know, I'm trying to figure out where this was, but I am pretty sure it was not during that time period. To the best of my recollection, it was not. Well, perhaps we can make it more specific. Uh, between September 20th and November 14th, 1963, did you, when uh, you went to work for Arnaud's, did you have occasion to leave the state of Louisiana? No, certainly not. I would have remembered that, I know. Now, perhaps since that is so clear in your mind... We can go to the next question. Between September 20th and November 14th, 1963, did you leave the city of New Orleans for more than a few hours? I don't think I left the city of New Orleans at all. The only time I remember was to go across Lake Pontchartrain. Oh, there was another thing I did. I passed out handbills on Magazine Street, where you had to be at a certain place at a certain time, and they put you in a truck and took you across the river, and I went over there and passed out handbills sometime during that October period, September-October period, when I was working at... At, and one other thing, they pay you something like, I think you work two days and they pay you something like $14. They take you over there. You work there two days in a row. I think one of them is a Thursday. They're always bums. Uh, you get down there and if you look sharp, you might get picked and they go over there and you get passed out bills. And Were you about to mention another job? What I was about to mention, another thing I remember was another person I was spending a lot of time with during September. I was going up to Loy's apartment and uh, talking to, now I don't know if it was early September or not, but I was spending a lot of time in Loy's apartment on Decatur Street, sitting there and talking to Buck Mashburn, who was going with Loy at the time, also named Tom Mashburn. He was a person who had a whole lot of knowledge and had a whole lot to say, and I would, what kind of business was he in? No business. Uh, he was a real strange guy. He made his living passing out these leaflets, and he had subsisted. He did not do anything more. He would get on things like medicine and go get all these books and articles on medicine and he would learn all about medicine. Then he would get on something else and uh, learn all about it. He was uh, fantastically efficient. And he said, you don't have to work except a couple days a week. Just go out and I don't even call that working. And he would just sit around Loy's all day. I went out with him one day and handing out handbills. We both had the same route. He was on one side of the street and I was on the other. I was just trotting along, and he was away ahead of me. He was very sharp and very coordinated. And sometime during that September-October period, I was out there doing that. Uh, they paid you, and they had you fill out Social Security forms and such stuff. Can you recall whether or not you were ever in Guy Bannister's office on Lafayette Street? I can't recall, but I know I saw him someplace, but I don't remember where. Have you ever seen Jack Martin? No, it doesn't ring a bell. How about Carlos Caroga? No. Guy Johnson? No. What was your connection with Victor Latham? Very close friend of mine. My closest friend. He knew me best, him and Loy. Where did you meet him? I met him when he was bartender at Rafino's, not too long after I got down to New Orleans. And I found this other girl, and her name was Carol Eden, and she was a grand person, and she was always at Rafino's. And we got to talking one night, and I said, where can I get in touch with you? And she said, I am always at Rafino's. And there was a bartender there, and I said, do you know Carol? Then we became acquainted, and he became a soda jerk at Pierre Antoine's. I was living up street at St. Louis uh, at Mrs. George's place, and he was a soda jerk there. And I would go sit at the counter, 
and he got my got me my typist for the Idol Warrior. Have you ever met Gordon Novell? No, not that I know of. Gordon was at the University of Southern California in 1957. I graduated from high school in 1957. When did you go to the University of Southern California? I went in 1958. You did not go there in 1957? No, because I graduated from high school in June, class of 1957. What did you do that fall? Join the Marine Corps. What did you do in the fall of 1957? In the fall of 57, okay. Oh, yes, I graduated in June of 57, and I enrolled in USC in the fall of 57. Then you were at USC in 57 and not 58. 57 and 58. That was the same year Gordon Novell was there. Did you ever meet him while you were there? No. Okay. Just when you think the plethora of connections cannot grow or have any more coincidence, if you want to call it that, or layer of coincidence, I present to you, <laughs> Gary Thornley and Gordon Novell went to the same fucking college, at least during the, during the fall 1957 semester. I did not know that. Hmm. And then they both end up in New Orleans and they both know David Ferry. Do you think that's a coincidence? <clears throat> I don't. To me, this is a pretty significant piece of the puzzle, the larger scale puzzle. All right, continuing on. Do you remember any of the on-campus recruiting activities which Central Intelligence Agency was conducting out there in 57 at the schools in California? No, I don't think I knew about the Central Intelligence Agency then. Did you ever meet a man named Frank Bartz? It doesn't ring a bell with me. Let me ask you a few questions and I think I can save some of your time. How about Thomas Beckham? No. Manuel Gill? No. Louis Rebel? No. Sergio Arcacha Smith? No. Isaac Casta Diego? No. How about David Ferry? Did you ever meet David Ferry? No. Nestor Marx Diaz? No. Where did you learn Spanish? I started taking Spanish in high school and I took it at USC. How much Russian did you learn at Atsugi? Not very much. I learned uh, speaking few Russian words. I only uh, went to two classes and lost interest or came back into the States. Uh, you cannot recall ever having been to Mancuso's Cafe ac across from the post office? I might have been while living on Camp Street in 1961. There was a good chance that I might have gone in there to eat. Do you remember that number on Camp Street? I think it is the 900 block. Uh, it is on the riverside across from the Confederate Museum by Lee's Circle there. The YMCA is on the other side. And the other landlord's name was Francis Landry. And he had a brother who was a policeman. And he had just shot a Negro. Have you ever been to Cats and Jammer Bar in Lafayette and Camp? No. Do you ever remember meeting with Ricardo Davis? No. Jeff Bitterson? No. You never met Jeff Bitterson? No. I was asked that before, and I still don't remember. Bill Young? No, Bill Young was the manager of the building 1824 Dauphine. You don't remember him? He might be the other guy, the roommate of Spencer. How about Virginia Johnson? Don't recall. She was the maid at 1824 Dauphine. They didn't have a maid for us. Uh, I didn't know there was a maid there. She was the maid for Spencer and also for Clay Shaw. <laughs> How about Leighton Martins? No. Did you ever meet Dr. Ketty of Covington? No. How about Dr. Martin Palmer? The only doctor, I'm trying to figure out his name, somebody who criticized the Idol Warrior and he taught at Tulane or LSU. No, it was not Dr. Martins Palmer. Dr. Martin Palmer. Was he a professor? 
he was a professor of literature or something. Uh, he didn't like people turning out literature. He didn't like the idle warrior because he said I was trying to propagandize. He said he didn't like people to turn out literature with their half-baked political ideas. What was his name? I don't know his name. I think it was uh, Martin McAuliffe, Dr. Martin McAuliffe. It sounded like that. Have you ever heard of Friends of Democratic Cuba? No. Would it refresh your memory if I told you that Martin McAuliffe was president of Friends of Democratic Cuba? Let me pause right here. Uh, Martin McAuliffe, as you'll recall from Carrie, uh, Carrie Thornley's confession letter to Garrison, uh, the 50-page affidavit, that he acknowledges that he was connected to Martin McAuliffe by, if I'm not mistaken, his girlfriend, Jessica Luck. Right? And Martin McAuliffe is the friends of... Uh, the. Uh, the president of Friends of Democratic Cuba. The Friends of Democratic Cuba uh, also was being run in New Orleans by, or associated with, he was the treasurer or something. Yeah, he was the treasurer, um, Sergio Arcacha Smith, right? Because Sergio Arcacha ends up getting kicked out of Friends of Democratic Cuba because he was embezzling the money, but it was a CIA front to embezzle money from the beginning, right? And that was all being run out of Guy Bannister's office at 544 Camp Street, right? So... Now that I've prefaced that, let me reread this question. Have you ever heard of Friends of Democratic Cuba? No. Would it refresh your memory if I told you that Martin McAuliffe was president of Friends of Democratic Cuba? No, not at all. He was an incorporator with Guy Bannister. I got the idea that McAuliffe was some kind of left-winger because he objected so strongly to the idle warrior and these half-baked political ideas, he said. How did you meet him? Joyce Talley, who was the typist for the idle warrior. Oh, it was Joyce Talley, not Jessica Luck, sorry. Joyce Talley, who was the typist for The Idle Warrior. He was her professor, and she kept telling how great this book was, and he had to read this book, so he came by and he read it, and he wanted to get some of it on a TV program. One chapter he wanted me to read on TV it was called One Windy Night, the name of the chapter. And it turned out that he liked the chapter, and he read some of the other chapters, but he said, uh, we had better stick to this chapter. How many times did you see him? I saw him a lot of times, 10 or 12, and we argued about this. And then one day, a year or six months later, I saw him again across the way. He said, hi. And I said, that is Martin McAuliffe. And he didn't like my book. And he overheard that. And he looked shocked. During the times you saw McAuliffe, you were not aware that he was president of Friends of Democratic Cuba. Was that the organization, a left or right wing? It was a CIA front used to purchase trucks and other things immediately before the Bay of Pigs. My impression of Martin McAuliffe was that he was a liberal of some kind, and I got this impression very strongly. I was not conservative in the traditional sense. I was not a racist or anything of that sort. Did you know any of his friends, like Joseph Moore? The only friend of his that I knew was Philip Boatwright, who was really a great guy. Afterwards, he was always thinking of Martin, knew about poetry and literature and all of this, and I would say that guy. I couldn't even understand what he thought literature was for. Did you know McAuliffe was the public relations manager for Sergio Arcacha? So here we go. This is the connection between Arcacha, Friends of Democratic Cuba, and all that stuff. No, he was seen in the company of Sergio Arcacha on several occasions of Friends of Democratic Cuba, was developed out of Sergio Arcacha's organization. How about Bill Dalzell? Did you ever know him? No. How about Charles White? No. Ever hear of Don Duty? No. You never encountered him in Mexico in 1963. The only people I met in Mexico were the people I mentioned from Guatemala. How about Martin Abelo? No. Who did you meet in Mexico from Guatemala? A bunch of kids in a bus station. They had packs on their backs and went to Guatemala. Where were they from? Pennsylvania. They were saying, oh boy, we'll be glad to get back. What a hole that was. And I said, where are you from? And they said, Pennsylvania. That was what transpired between us. Did you ever meet Kent Courtney? I worked for him through some temporary employment agency for two days in 1961. I stuffed envelopes out there, and this was when I decided, you know, I read this Ayn Rand thing, and I said, this is what, what street was this on? I don't know. It was out there in the Garden District. Pelican Printing Company? I don't know about that. Courtney's company publishes The Independent American. Uh, that was what we were stuffing when I got out there, and that is what I started talking about when I got out there, and afterwards... I talked to so many people about working for Kent Courtney. That is when I realized I was not conservative. <laughs> oh my God, I fucking hate this guy. 
Now, Mr. Courtney is very close to Brunier, Carlos Brunier. Did you meet him? Not that I know of. Let me pause right here because I would beg to differ. Like I said on the last show, I believe it was Carrie Thornley who went and met with Carlos Brunier, but he knew Brunier because they're both fucking low-level spooks. Uh, so he goes and meets with Brunier, and that began the setup of Oswald's August 9th incident on the street with Brunier when he's handing out the communist pa- uh, pamphlets, and Brunier's like, don't take this, people. This is propaganda. It was Carrie Thornley who met with Brunier. Not fucking Oswald. Oswald is such a goddamn idiot. He's such a dupe in all this. Did you ever meet Carlos Brunier? Not that I know of. Have you ever been in Mr. Brunier's little shop on Chartres Street? No, I have never been in there. Are you aware that Oswald also applied for a job at Courtney's? Mo told me yesterday that he worked there through a one employment agency. Have you ever met Louis Davis? No. How about Dr. Gustav Von Ehr? No. Carol de Montfort? No. Tommy Baumler? No. Ernesto Rodriguez? No. Ross Buckley? No. Reverend Edward Hovis? No. Something sounds familiar, but no reverend. Ever meet an Edward Hovis? I don't think so. Ho something. I don't think it was Hovis. Did you ever see Jesse Corr on any other occasion? I never saw him that time. Clint went into the office and I was standing out in the hall looking at these relics from Guatemala. Ever hear of John Alice in the International Trademark? No. How about a man named John C. Martin? No. Alvin Bobuf? No. Melvin Coffey? I heard of someone named Coffey because I thought, what a strange name. Where did you hear it? I don't know where I heard it. Somewhere when I was in New Orleans. I can't recall the incident. I just recall the name Coffee. Can you recall who mentioned it? No, I just recalled the name Coffee and thinking it was such a strange name. You wouldn't recall having met him? No. How about Margaret Tate? She's a real estate agent. Yes. Yes, I know her. Where did you meet her? I looked for apartments through her. On how many occasions would you say you met her? I would say twice. It might have been Barrack Street where I lived. 717 Barrack Street? Yes. I might have been through it might have been through her that I rented a place there. She's in partnership with Jeff Bitterson. How about Philip Jirachi? No. How about Vance Blaylock? No. How about Dean Andrews? No. The only time I think I heard of Dean Andrews was when I went up to the FBI and they asked me, Do you know an attorney in New Orleans by the name of Dean Andrews? And when his name came out in this thing, I said to myself, I bet that is the attorney. But you never met him. No. How about Kenneth Leckie? No. John Dote? No. Bootsy Gay? Bootsy Gay rings a bell. Uh, Now I knew a girl named Bootsy uh, who went with Jim Dyer. She ran around the Bourbon House a lot. She was kind of a homely chick, a very promiscuous, a real character. How about Al Clark? Up at the, uh, I met him the other night. I mean, before the assassination, had you ever met him? I think I met him in 64, too. Uh, he doesn't uh, remember it. We were introduced just the other night, and I said I met you before. The last time I was here, the last time before, was when I was down here for a week. Notice he asked him about 63, and he answered 64. Uh, how about Dave Chandler? The only time I heard of this guy was Bill Turner told me I had been seen with this guy, and I said, who is he? I said, that's great, but who the hell is Dave Chandler? You know, it's great to be told you're seen with people, and I have to be told who they are. And I told Clinton, I said, who is this Dave Chandler? And he said, oh, Dave Chandler is a stringer for Life Magazine down here. He said, that's the guy who writes articles for Life. Oh, so Kerry Thornley, he's, he's, he's being told by a lot of people. He's seen with a lot of people. He just don't know if I can remember. Maybe this guy's got Alzheimer's or something. Did you ever meet Dave Chandler? I never met Dave Chandler as far as I know. How about a man, Ape Ames? Doesn't sound familiar. Melvin Sealing? No. Andrew Blackman? No. How about Harold Tannenbaum? No, I don't think so. Frank Karachi? No, that name Karachi doesn't ring a bell. Davis? Gene Davis? Gene Davis, I heard that name somewhere. You ever meet her? Him? Yes. Oh, no. Oh, that was good. So, the question is, Gene Davis, do you know Gene Davis? And he goes, Gene Davis, I heard that name somewhere. And then the question by the lawyer is, have you ever met her? And Carrie Thornley goes, him. 
And then the lawyer says, yes. And then the answer is, oh, no. <coughs> That's funny. Have you ever been to Wanda's Seven Seas Bar? That's the one way up, uh, the one on Iberville. No, I've never been in there. Have you ever been to the Court of Two Sisters? I was in there once, I think, and I had a fight with the waiter. Did you ever meet Harold Sandoz? No. What was the waiter's name you had the fight with? Uh, Henry Avery. Ever known a man named Joseph de Blanco? No. Joseph Peterson? No. How about Miguel Torres? No. Emmanuel Torres? No. There was a guy in the Marine Corps named Torres, Nat Torres. Uh, they called him TJ, and I knew a Chuck Torres in a fraternity somewhere. Chuck Torres, he was a member of the fraternity I was in at USC. I was a pledge, uh, Delta Sigma Pi. Did you ever know a, name, a man named Thurman Cooley? No. Dejanovich. Dejanovich. Dejanovich and Cooley were in Max 9. Yes. They were from Louisiana, weren't they? Oh, I don't know. Uh, that's one of the names I remembered when they were asking about Heidel. I said there was a man in that outfit named Cooley, and Dejanovich uh, was in that outfit. I remember hearing the names at Muster. Have you ever been to Hammond, Louisiana? No. Who do I know uh, had something to do with Hammond, Louisiana? Some friend of mine had been out there when I was uh, in the quarter, I think. Slim Brooks. He had been out there just before I arrived. Where is he from? He was originally from some place in the Midwest. Uh, he was a seaman and had tuberculosis, and he is still in the quarter. I gave his name and address to. Uh, what does he have to do with Hammond? He was here before I got to French Quarter, and he said he went up to Hammond, and I get along with all those people up there, and I get along with these people down here. What did he say uh, he was doing up there? He was working at a lumber mill. I don't know, something I just don't know. He had been there before he got tuberculosis. Or what it was, but several times he mentioned Hammond, Louisiana to me. He was a very, he was very proud that he could get along with people from any part, anywhere. I'm pausing here because something just got me. Uh, it says here he was working at a lumber mill. up in Hammond, Louisiana. And the reason this catches my attention is because when I was looking into um, Robert Earl Croft, the guy who took the Croft photo, who was clearly not Robert Earl fucking Croft in Dealey Plaza. I've talked about this before. When I dug into his background in family history and lineage and all that shit, I remembered that uh, his family was very military oriented, but they were directly connected to, the guy, to a guy who was the owner of a lumber mill in fucking... Uh, Louisiana, uh, owner of a lumber mill in Louisiana. So that's why this catches my attention here. Is there a connection? I don't fucking know at all. Of course, I just, I just now first discovered this, but um, I'm going to have to dig up my all my goddamn shit I did on Robert L. Croft because I feel like that's the Robert L. Croft stuff. I kind of figured out a little bit. It wasn't Robert L. Croft in Daily Plaza who took the Robert L. Croft photo, uh, but um, there's. I felt like there was so much more to it. I found that he was connected to, the, he was married into the Welch family. It's like the Minutemen and John Birch and all that stuff and I don't know. I'm like, my spidey sense is tingling here, uh, and I don't know why. But there's this lumber mill shit is, uh, was what triggered that. All right. Uh, for my guys in my uh, research chat, um, just take note of that, please. Um, <clears throat> did you ever meet William Klein? The name Klein sounds familiar, but I don't connect it with New Orleans or the French Quarter. Um, ever meet a man named Barragona? No. How about Gerald Patrick Henry? Oh, an alias for, uh, <laughs> uh, an alias for fucking Jerry Hemming. Uh, no, that doesn't sound familiar. Very tall, about six foot eight, 250 pounds. No, I am trying to think of somebody. He's a friend of Lauren Hall's. Have you ever met him? He's been in the paper recently. No, I saw his picture in the free press, read all about him there. Lawrence Howard. As far as I know, I never met him. That's false because in his confession to Garrison, he admits he met a, a Hispanic named Leopoldo. That's Lawrence Howard. So lying again. As far as I know, I never met him. Billy Seymour? No. How about Bruce Ray Carlin? Okay, so Bruce Ray Carlin is someone I really need to fucking dig into. And I'll tell you why. Bruce Ray Carlin is hooked up with Tammy. What the fuck is her name? One of the strippers for Jack Ruby. Uh, no, 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 no. It was um, the blonde haired chick whose hair was like a foot fucking tall. And not Candy Bar. Oh, it's on the tip of my fucking tongue. 
hey, I got 10,000 fucking names in my head. I can't remember them all at any given moment. Although it's trying to come out. I can sense it. It's trying to come out. She was in Dealey Plaza. Okay, she was definitely in fucking Dealey Plaza. I'm assuming Bruce Ray Carlin was in Dealey Plaza too. But see, Bruce Ray Carlin is an associate of Jack Ruby. I'm going to get to the short of it. And at the time of the assassination, allegedly he was in like New Orleans and he was bouncing around between Dallas and then he left for New or- then he left for New Orleans and then to Houston and back up to um back up to Dallas. So I am I, Bruce Ray Carlin is one of these guys who I'm convinced was involved with the post assassination moving people around shenanigans cuz remember you got Jack Ruby brings Andrew Jerome Blackman down to um, ultimately to Galveston, right? But they're checked into the hotel in Al Motel on the night of the 23rd when Sergio Arcacha and the other fucking guys are at the Driftwood in Galveston. They're back in, in Houston, right? But Bruce Ray Carlin had to have been one of these fucking guys who was ended up driving people around. He Maybe he drove... Um, Maybe he's the one who fucking actually drove a uh, black men to get back to his boat from the motel in Houston, possibly. But no, but Jack Ruby did go to Galveston because he was seen in like a sporting goods store, like buying or selling a gun. And that's documented by the FBI. So uh, Jack Ruby definitely went to Galveston. But Bruce Ray Carlin, the point I'm making is Bruce Ray Carlin is one of these guys who was bouncing around De- uh, Texas this weekend after the assassination, obviously he was involved in driving people where they needed to go, or perhaps people back to, or maybe even Jack Ruby back to Dallas. Yeah, that would make perfect sense. We'll leave that open for possibility. Uh, My research chat guys, please note Bruce Ray Carlin. We're going to look into him fairly soon. Uh, No, it doesn't ring a bell. Have you ever met Tommy Cox? There was a sergeant in Max 9 named Cox. He hung out with a guy named O'Leary. They were both kind of beatniks. Have you ever met a guy named Jack Lawrence? Don't think so. How about a young man named Buell Resley Frazier? There was a guy named Frazier in boot camp with me in 1956. He was a real eight ball. I don't know if I knew anyone else named Frazier. Uh, did you ever have occasion to be in Irving, Texas or Oak Cliff? One time I'm away from New Orleans to the Freedom School. Just note, Freedom School in Colorado and and fucking CIA, screaming CIA, okay? But he admits going to this place called the Freedom School, which is really some right-wing Ayn Rand-type fucking bullshit scam run by the CIA, okay? (laughs) That's what it is. I bet it's about as real as the fucking, um, what was that fucking college uh, that uh, Oswald allegedly went to overseas? The Albert Schweitzer School? (laughs) Okay, so uh, uh, one time on my way from New Orleans to the Freedom School, I got off the bus and had a two-hour stopover in Texas because I wanted to go to the book depository, and I went to a policeman and asked him where the book depository was, and he told me where it was, and I went up and looked at it. And then I decided I will ride buses around, and I just got on the first bus and didn't go to Irving, where I went and back of the book depository over this way. Did you ever meet Jack Helm? Helm is a familiar name in the Marine Corps. Uh, These are not the Marines. Did you ever meet him? Not that I remember. What about Larry Schmidt? It doesn't ring a bell. A preacher named Reverend Brochier. It says Brocher, but it's Brochiers. No. How about a man named Richard Nagel? A guy in high school was named Nagel or Nadel or something like that. Uh, in Jim, in high school. <clears throat> in Whittier? Yes. This is where I connected him. Uh, now, maybe he was in the Marine Corps. I don't think so. I think that is where he was. How about Fred Lee Chrisman? No. Ever meet a man named Alfred Bowen? There was a Sergeant Bowen in the Marine Corps. No Bowman or Bowman. How about John Howard Bowen? No. And then they break for lunch. And then Mr. Garrison talks to him when he comes when they come back. Mr. Garrison says, "Have you ever been to the uh, Dresden Room in Los Angeles?" No. When did you leave Los Angeles? Which time, sir? The last time. Just before Dave Lipton called me a few days after. Last year sometime? Yes, in October. Did you ever meet Gene Bradley out there? I don't think so. You're not sure? I don't remember the name. It doesn't ring a bell. Have you ever seen his picture in the paper? Eugene Bradley. No, I was thinking of a girl again. Oh, this is the guy who took the lie detector out there. I know who you mean. This picture was in the free press. I know who you mean. I didn't see him out there, no. Then you've never seen him? No. Have you ever had an occasion to attend any anti-Castro meetings? 
No, I have never attended any anti-Castro meetings, and I never joined any anti-Castro organization. I have expressed anti-Castro views on occasion to people working with me at the Sheraton Charles, but I never attended any of the meetings. Who introduced you to Martin McAuliffe? Joyce Talley, the girl who was typing my manuscript, uh, The Idle Warrior. Does she live here now? I don't know. She dropped out of uh, sight shortly after that. Where does she live? Out in Metairie, someplace like that. She lived out in the suburbs. I think she had a little girl or boy, a couple of kids. Uh, she was a young girl, though. She was going to LSU or wherever McAuliffe was teaching. And she was in his literature class, and she kept up on telling him, you have to go out and read this book. And I know he read that one chapter and wanted to get it on television program of some kind. And then he read the other chapters. He liked the chapter, and he looked at the next one and the next one and the next one and started not liking them. And then he said, people who tried to get your half-baked political ideas in literature and you mess up literature, you know, he was being a purist. What business are you in now? I'm a freelance writer and occasionally I work for temporary employment called Employer's Overload. What magazines are you published in? Well, I had one last year come out in the Cavalier in May in 1965 issue. I had one. I'm having one in the second issue of the Advance Guard whenever it comes out. I have published newsletters, which I also edit on the coast. It's a newsletter called, and that's redacted for some fucking reason. Does this bring you income? Yes, some. What do you average a year from writing? Not very much. Uh, this stuff about how much money I make is sort of thing. It's sort of hard for me to recall. Because Guy's got the worst fucking memory ever, huh? Because every year I get all these receipts and everything. You don't have to work as a waiter anymore. Uh, for the last little bit over a year, I've been managing to stay alive with my writings. Just about paid my rent. Uh, my wife is working now. Do you have any trouble with uh, income tax reports? I have trouble figuring them out. I give them to a woman uh, named uh, Louise Teeter out in Los Angeles, and she figures them out for me. I just gave her all the receipts, and she just likes to do it and saves me that money, and we just pay her $10, you know. Where did you stay the six days in Mexico? I stayed at a hotel, I believe it was called the Hotel Marlin, like a fish. I stayed there, and I was upstairs above the lobby, and I came down to watch television once in a while in the lobby. And where'd you pick up your Spanish? I took Spanish all through high school, practically, and I majored in Spanish in high school, and I didn't know you could major in anything in high school. And I took Spanish at USC. What courses did you take in 1957, your first semester? I majored in journalism. I didn't get any journalism courses because they had all these freshman courses I had to take. I took a freshman English course. I took one one year. I took a biology course. It was very advanced biology course, and I felt uh, and very similar to high school where I went. It was very similar, to, so I practically slept through it and got very good marks. Well, let's go back to something else. Let me ask you this. Are you sure that you never saw Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans in 1963? For a while, you seemed to be on the fence. No, the only time I ever thought I did was when Barbara Reed was so sure about it, and I became convinced. But I am sure I did not see Oswald and recognize him in New Orleans in 1963. You are telling me there was a point when she had convinced you you were with Oswald. Yes, she had convinced me, certainly. There was the two hours or so she was talking to me, and she said, Carrie... What must have happened was this. You must have walked into Bourbon House, and he must have walked in. You must have seen that his face was familiar, but not recognized him out of uniform and all this stuff. And he must have sat down next to you. She was so certain, so positive. Did it seem to you that was possible? It seemed to be possible. When she got all, though, until the next day, and people began to say Barbara Reed connects herself with everything that happens, then it seemed impossible. Does it seem possible now? Well, no, it doesn't seem possible to me unless I was drugged or something. Why did you have such an unusual interest in Oswald that you were writing a book about him? Because he went to the Soviet Union just when I was figuring out why people get disillusioned in the Far East. Did you ever write a book about anyone else? A nonfiction book the, about Oswald called Oswald. Have you ever written any book about anyone else? I wrote part of a book based on myself and Jessica and Grace Kaplinger and Rob. It was about the French Quarter and... It was called Come Out and Play With Me. I was always going to write a book called The Prince of Bourbon Street on Dan Cartier. And I was going to write a, you know, I was always getting ideas for books. And I was end up starting them and not finishing them. And I was going to do one of the folk singers. Do one on the folk singers. Uh, don't you feel that the probability is that if you are writing about a man for several years and he walks in the room, you would probably recognize him. I feel that I certainly would. The only possibility would be that they showed me those pictures of Oswald yesterday and I thought he didn't have a utility cap on in the Marine Corps. He had this cap on all the time. That was it. The thing was I saw his face in the papers and all that and he looked so much the same way he looked in Max 9. 
Where did you usually see Martin McAuliffe? In the Bourbon House. And I saw him. He was one of the first people I was introduced to in New Orleans. He was interested in the Idol Warrior, and we talked about it a whole lot, and I kept seeing him at the Bourbon House. And Joyce made this appointment to bring him in and everything, and I kept seeing him in there. Have you ever met Marina? Dum, da dum, dum. Not that I know of. I thought I saw her standing, waiting for a bus when I got off here, but Mo said he wasn't sure. It wouldn't be her because she wouldn't be alone. Anytime a paragraph is extremely important because of whatever reason, I'm just going to go ahead and read it fucking twice and not even warn you, okay? Not that I know of. I thought I saw her standing waiting for a bus when I got off here. But Mo said he was sure it wouldn't be her. It wasn't her because she wouldn't be alone. But you did not meet her in 1963. Not that I know of. This is the thing. The French Quarter is such a small place. You see each other, even though there are a lot of people and you pass by somebody on the street and not recognize them. Of course, I would not have recognized her then because I would not have known who she was. When did you make the decision to move to the Arlington area? After the assassination or before? Yes, after the assassination. I think the letter came after the assassination and the invitation was kind of a standing one and I knew I was welcome. And he kind of reminded me of it, and I thought that would be some place where I could go and have some place to eat while I was looking for a job, and it was close to New York where I was planning to go. You don't have his address now. No, I don't, but I have it at home. I can call my wife, and she can give it to you. Who does he work for? I don't know who he works for. At the time, he worked for a thing called the Alexandria Technical Institute. Sounds like CIA. Or something. He was a teacher, and it was a guy who was starting to start some kind of college in a building that was in a supermarket-type thing. And he was sort of a nut of some kind. You want to stand outside for a moment? And that seems to be the end of it. That appears to be the end of it. And then it is certified by Maureen B. Teal, it looks like. All right. So. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the uh, Carrie Thornley Clayshaw deposition or grand jury testimony. I think it's pretty clear how full of shit the guy is. I think it's pretty clear that he keeps dropping all these names on purpose in hopes to get the heat off of him. But it's not going to work, is it? Because we are onto him. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to dig through some of this background stuff. Um, well, what appeared to me at one time to be background stuff, which is actually now becoming front and center in my research, isn't it? I'm going to dig up the stuff on... Um, I don't think we're going to get to Philip Jirachi yet, but we're going to try to get stuff on Philip Boatwright and Martin McAuliffe and um, Clint Bolton. Yeah, I think those three guys are what we're going to get into next. If I can find anything, I'll do my best. But um, thanks for tuning in, guys. If you haven't bought my book, please go to Amazon. Please buy the book. All right. A Warning from History. The definitive book on the Kennedy assassination. So that's going to do it for today, guys. And um, I'll be back tomorrow. And we will pick up with some, what, I'm, what I consider fresh research. Fresh, new, most likely never before seen because of the lazy fucks in the Kennedy research community probably haven't even read this shit. But yeah, that's what we're going to do tomorrow. All right, so uh, please make sure to tune in. Thanks, guys. <laughs>